Hello, welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram, and today is March 29th, 2017. This is Walk in the Park, walkinthepark.tv to see all of my episodes. Got them all online there. This one will be up soon. This is a public access television show on Pegasus Studios in Ithaca, New York, Channel 13, and also up online at walkinthepark.tv once we get this out. So go to my website. You can see the full schedule. You can also go to the Pegasus website. So uh, today we're going to go fishing in a way. We're going to learn about fish in Cayuga Lake. This past weekend, there was a um, uh, program at Ithaca High School aimed particularly at youth put on by the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network and Trout Unlimited, the local chapter of Tra Trout Unlimited. So there were a number of workshops going on. I was particularly drawn to one by a guy named Mel Russo of the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network who did a program about the origin of fish in Cayuga Lake. So uh, let's go right to it. It's gonna take just about all of the show to see his presentation, The Origin of the Fish Species in Cayuga Lake. So there's 11 finger lakes. These are all the lakes over here. I hope you can see them. And the, uh, Seneca is the deepest, Cayuga is the lowest. And uh, Cayuga is also the largest surface area of both, even though the people that live on Seneca would like to say that it's Seneca. Our surface area is a, maybe a, a mile or two square larger. They have a whole bunch more volume of water, however, and that's why they say it's the largest. This is a chart, a maximum depth chart of Seneca Lake and Cayuga Lake heading south. And as you can see Seneca Lake is a lot more endowed with space than Cayuga Lake. The last glacier came in, it started over here in uh, Labrador, there we go, and it's an area called the Laurentine Highlands, and it worked its way down to about here. Well eventually the glacier started to melt and it released voluminous quantities of water, huge, huge quantities of water. So much water that it was like worse than, than uh, Niagara Falls, just because it melted so much uh, and it changed into liquid water. So then we ended up with this uh, Lake, Lake Ithaca and Lake Watkins. I think this is, this is Cayuga over here. We ended up with Lake Ithaca and Lake Watkins. And as, as the, so forget about this part for now, as the glacier melted back, it released these waters into the valleys. So eventually, <coughs> Lake Ithaca and Lake Watkins, the water uh, retreated back to uh, Lake Ontario here. But, but, and it was releasing so much water, but th these lakes were connected, Seneca and Cayuga, were connected, and there was no land exposed as, I'm sorry, there was no land exposed as far south as Ovid. So if you go to Ovid, that was underwater. Seneca Falls was underwater, all that stuff. So that was Lake Newberry. Well anyway, the story about all this, when all this water was rushing down out of the glacier, how does it relate to the fish? It was capturing other streams, marshes, streams, all kinds of things. And so that started the initial colonization of, the, of uh, Lake Ithaca and Lake Watkins. Whatever was living in the, tw the 12 rivers, or 14 or 13, whatever there were, that was completely wiped out, plus everything on the land about a million years ago by the glacier, right? <laughs> Okay, so they were complete. So this all had, they all had to start from scratch. There's nothing alive in the, in the crevices of the, of the river valleys, nothing alive on the land. So all this stuff had to be recolonized. So the first recolonization started when <coughs> the glacier uh, retreated back here and it was capturing different streams and, and uh, marshes and what are other lakes and so on. Okay, I think, uh, so here's the extent of, of the Laurentine ice right to here. You can see here's Lake Ontario, 
Here's the St. Lawrence outlet. Once the, la the glacier got up to Lake Ontario, right here, this whole thing was just full of water. Everything because there's so much water coming off of the glacier, the water was down to like Danby, is what they say. But once it got up to uh, the St. Lawrence, then it was able to outlet to the east. Before that, they, all these lakes outletted to the south because it all was, the, it was blocked. Okay, so once it got up to here, then you were able to get fish in from, from the, the uh, St. Lawrence. You're able to get fish in, besides that, from the Susquehanna. Before that, they say about 60% of the fish come from uh, the Lake Ontario area and about 40% of the fish come from the, from the Susquehanna when they were hooked up to that. Okay, so what are we up to next? How do we get there? So anyway, while all this stuff was melting, there were, there, the uh, Lake Ontario and all the Great Lakes got hooked up to the Mississippi. And the Mississippi was a fish source for, for the uh, the southern fish to come, come up the Mississippi. When the glacier got way up here, it melted, and there was this Lake Ojibwa and Lake Agisi, so huge connected freshwater lakes. And they hooked up to the uh, Hudson Bay as well, and they flowed down into Lake Superior, and there was a source of fish, uh, fish there. So the cold water fish, like the trout and salmon, the, unless they were introduced, they came from the north. The warm water fish, most of them came from the south, like the gar, the bowfins, the shiners, the minnows, the darters, the sunfish. From the west, you got the darters. Some of you maybe not know what those fish are, but the sauger, those are like perch-related pumpkin seeds. These are sunfish and the yellow perch, the killifish, and the pumpkin seed, they came from the east and the west through the drainage collected from the east and the west into the, into the uh, Great Lakes and then into the Finger Lakes eventually. So they kind of like fall down the Great Lakes maybe, and then they come into the Finger Lakes. And eventually, on their own, they got into Cayuga Lake before the canals, the American eel. As some people say about the Atlantic salmon, that's the one that's in this lake, which is now stocked. Uh, when the Jesuits first came here in the, in the eight, early 18th century, these, you could walk across the salmon in any of the creeks. There were so many, they could paddle them, hit them on the head with a paddle and fill up their boat in a few minutes. There were so many salmon. So when we got here and we noticed them, they were indigenous to Cayuga Lake and Seneca Lake, not above that because they couldn't jump that falls. Uh, the rainbow trout uh, was introduced in 1875 from the west coast. The brown trout came in from Europe in 1883. Can you imagine people in 1875 said, I think I'll get some brown trout. Now here's another thing. The, the smelt, which are now decreased Seriously, uh, the population has seriously been decreased. Uh, people don't really know why, except that the zebra mussels have probably eaten them out of their food chain, uh, out of the base of their food chain, along with themselves now, the zebra mussel population is starting to decrease, and, uh, and that's because one of the experts thinks they've eaten themselves out of food. So when the food comes back, either the zebra mussels will come back or the smelt may come back, there are smelt in the lake. We have caught smelt. So then that's a big argument how they got here. Because they want, uh, some people think they were introduced. And some people think that because Cayuga Lake li lies so low, I don't know if you can see, it's the lowest line of all the lakes. It stayed associated with Lake Iroquois, which is a huge extension of Lake Ontario. It's like a, oversized Lake Ontario, Lake Cayuga was the lowest, so there was an arm of Lake Iroquois, oversized Lake Ontario, that they came down, and they think that smelt are indigenous to Lake Ontario, and because of that long association, they got in there. 
Meanwhile, they may have been introduced into the upper Great Lakes. Now, let's see, the common carp started showing up in, uh, in the lake in 1888. There were three or four farm ponds where they raised these carp in 1886. And, and around in there, and they raised them for food, for livestock, for themselves, because they're very prolific. The farm ponds overflowed, and they overflowed into Salmon Creek, uh, Fall Creek, a tributary to the Cayuga Inlet, and then in 1889, bang, they showed up in the lake. And since the canal was already there, all the locks and everything were there, they went from Cayuga Lake over to Seneca Lake by the way of the locks. Another uh, story behind uh, the alewife, or we call them saw bellies. People think that Seth Green, some people think that Seth Green, an early conservationist, introduced them into uh, Cayuga Lake as purposely for food for the lake trout. Uh, meanwhile, they were introduced in a whole bunch of places. Then we have our buddy the round goby that came in by way of the ships emptying their ballast coming in from Europe and through the St. Lawrence and into, into the uh, Lake Ontario. And uh, other things got in that way, like the uh, zebra mussels, which are not a fish. You know that they're a mollusk. If I can remember, the zebra, zebra mussels came in in the early 90s. The round goby came in in the new millennium. All right, and these guys read and write they went around the lake in 1909 and made a catalog of all the vertebrates in the lake. We have in the petrum the lampreys, we have the sea lamprey, but we also have a non-parasitic one called the uh, brook lamprey that just feeds off of the algae and so on. Here's our buddy, the sea lamprey, that came in via the canals. The sea lamprey, instead of, it's a very primitive fish, they're jawless fishes. Uh, I think their order, the name of the order is Agnatha, Agnatha, or something, yeah, Agnatha which means no, no jaws. And it has seven gill apertures. You got another one of this? Oh, there's his mouth. See, they, got, they don't have any jaws. They got suckers and hooks. It looks like a little guy in there, too, eating the food up. But anyway, this is the mouth of the sea lamprey. They hook on to specially soft-scaled fish, and they suck the blood out of them. And it's already digested material in there, most of it. Test themselves, the whole fish, look at that, okay. All right, this is another primitive fish that's supposed to be in our lake. That would be the lake sturgeon. And they are stocks now, but they are indigenous species to Cayuga Lake. Uh, and they don't, they're the only thing that could be a, the equivalent of jaws, because they get to be seven feet thick or long, <laughs> they get to be seven feet long, but they don't have any jaws. They just got these nice, big, serious lips here that suck up bottom material. This is the, this is the long-nosed gar, okay? Another primitive fish. The Indians used to use it for armor. They used to use the skin for armor because they have a particular kind of scales called ganoid scales. They're very tough. But anyway, they got all these teeth but they have electros, electro sensors in their beak that can sense a fish running by. And they usually hang around like a log or something on the surface, and bang, they, they get the prey. Next one. And they're harmless to humans. This is a bowfin, another primitive fish. You can identify that by the ocellus and near the base of the tail. And that's a very primitive, the, right, there we go. We have those. We've got them in the south end, we've got them in the north end, not so much everywhere else because the water's so deep. This would be the uh, channel cat. We have those in the lake. People call them a spotted cat. This is the yellow bullhead, which I have, I don't think I've ever caught one. The, the bullheads that we catch in the lake, I, I'm quite sure are brown bullheads. See this? They got a uh, spiny uh, pectoral fin. A bad spine, you can get stuck good with it. But if you grab that spine, where the, where the spine is, not the, not the uh, ray part of the fin, but there's a spine right there, you grab that and you feel a little barb like you would on the end of a hook, then that's a brown bullhead. Let's go. 
There's a bridal mad time. It's another member of the uh, catfish family that belongs in the lake. Very small. Brindled mad time, I'm sorry, brindled. And we have the common white sucker, which are right now probably starting to run up the creeks because of all the precipitation. When it's about 50 degrees, when the stream temperature changes about 50, you get the suckers and you get the smelt going up there. <laughs> this is a northern hog sucker. I've, I've never caught one of them, but Reed and Wright reported them in the lake. Let's go. The Western Creek Chub Sucker. <laughs> Sounds like we're going through. Anyway, I've never caught one of them, but they're in the lake, according to Reed and Wright. The Northern Shorthead Red Horse Sucker. I've seen them uh, being caught in, uh, at Mays Point. Okay, the Northern Red Bellied Day. Now we're into the minnow family right now. That was the sucker family. This is all the minnow family. Let's see, we're gonna have to go through these quickly. The blunt nose minnow, the northern creek chub, the western black nose dace, the horny head chub. This is a carp. We said that got introduced in 1888 by mistake. Okay. They came from uh, Europe. This is your American eel with the jaws. You notice he's got the jaws. American eel's got the jaws. They're supposed to be pretty tasty. I think the lo the big the longest one that somebody told me about was from the top of a hung from the top of a overhead garage door and hit the ground, hit the floor. That's how big they could get. And they go all the way back, they go all the way to the so they live about eight years in the lake after they get here. Uh, and they go all the way back to the Sargasso Sea, and all the eels from North America go there, some from Europe go over there for a little action. This, this is our buddy, the alewife. You notice you can see the spiny scoots. That's where they get the name sawbelly. And again, they were introduced. They may have caused a lot of damage to the ecology of the lake. They may have. Uh, right now, uh, last uh, spring, somebody called me and said there are all kinds of smelt in, in the cove. So they're, they thought there were smelt, like I told them they were, they were sawbellies. OK, gizzard shad. It's in the herring family. With the, with the saw belly. Now the whitefish is another big story of the lake. Everybody thinks is there are supposed to be whitefish in the lake, but they're, I think they're ciscos. And each of the finger lakes, almost, like Canandaigua, Skinny Atlas, uh, Owasco, Seneca, Cayuga, they all have their species, little uh, uh, subspecies of whitefish. This is a cisco. This is a cisco. That there's, there's about 54 kinds of ciscos, and most of them are subspecies. The brown trout was introduced when did we say 1888, 1880, some six or eight. The brown trout was introduced from Europe. So the rainbow came from the west coast. Introduced. They're traveling up the streams probably pretty soon, if not already. Brook trout, indigenous to the Cougar Lake Basin, came from these big giant freshwater lakes up in the, up in the north there, Lake Agassiz and Ojibwa, these two. And as the glacier put a lot of water out, they came down to Cougar Lake. Okay, the lake trout is indigenous to Cougar Lake. Now most of the population is stocked because of the high siltation going on. The Atlantic salmon, we have, we just saw an article in the Ithaca Times, we have the best salmon fishery in New York State right there in Cuga Lake. Uh, the salmon were indigenous to Cuga Lake, but we don't think there's any natural reproduction going on at, at this time. 99.99% are stocked. The rainbow smelt, we have a big story about that and how they got here. I'm sure they're there. With the food chain has to replenish itself and they'll, they'll be back. And remember, they're fussy. The mud minnow, they like little sluggish waters. Another, another uh, anomaly for a fish, go ahead. Ah, the chain pickerel. They catch a lot of those up at the north end of the lake. In the grassy side, we catch them all the way down the lake in the 
in the littoral zone, not in the deep water. The northern pike, another indigenous species, catch it all the way from the north end to the south end. Ah, the banded killifish. Somebody knocked on my door, a bait, a bait collection, you know, the guys that sold bait, say 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> Somebody knocks on the door and they say, what, Mel, what is this fish? I said, well, that's the eastern banded killifish. <laughs> they want to know if they could use it for bait. Well, at that time, couldn't use it for bait. Now you can, apparently. The eastern banded killifish, or I guess we just call it the banded killifish. The brook stickleback, they like the sluggish waters. We have those. Those are about, you know, really tiny fish. The trout perch is like, it's a, another fish anomaly. Can we say that? It has the adipose fin, like the trout, but it has satenoid scales like a perch. So they call it the trout perch. And when you're catching, when you're looking for smelt, you're looking around there at night, you put the flashlight down, you're in about that much water, you'll see them down there, either going up the stream or at the mouth of the stream looking for little crustaceans. Trout perch, they're cool fish. And it's, it's good bait. Oh, the Northern Brook Silverside, an invisible, a tra no, a transparent fish. Look at that one, we got that. You could, they, they also call them skipjacks. There's a whole bunch of them at the north end. Some, at any given night that's calm, you can hear them jumping around out there. The, the Brook Silverside, see how transparent there is the ribs? Okay. Oh, the Black Crappie. <sighs> A member of the sunfish family. Plentiful in the north end. Northern rock bass, plentiful throughout the basin. Here's a whole bunch more of the sunfish family. We have the warm mouth, the green sunfish, the northern long-eared sunfish, the orange spotted sunfish, the bluegill, and the pumpkin seed. Pumpkin seed's got a little red mark, bluegill is all blue. And those are the most common of all of them. I think we see some of these once in a while, the long-eared. Okay. These are another sunfish, although everybody calls them bass. There's a smallmouth bass. And the way to tell if it's a smallmouth bass, besides most of the experienced fishermen can tell them by the color. Unless they're hanging around in the wrong place, then their colors can change. But if you take the, the end of the jaw, shouldn't go past the midpoint of the eye, and it looks like in this one it does. It should be like that. But it should be the hinge of the jaw, which is right here, I guess. The hinge of the jaw doesn't go past the midpoint of the eye. Then we got the large mouth bass. Look at the difference in the jaw. It's common, in the, especially in the north end, and under docks and trees and all that stuff. The walleye. We don't have too many walleye. Uh, Reed and Wright reported them as very rare but they said they were in the lake. Mostly they catch them at uh, mud locks, which, is the lo which are the locks at the north end. The sauger, which is now, I don't, I'm not sure, what's the ruling on the sauger now? I don't think you could keep them. Uh, but they're a perch-related fish like the walleye, and you're not supposed to catch, you're not supposed to keep them. Ah, our buddy the yellow perch, you can catch up to 50 of these in the lake and there are a lot of them. Tessellated darter, who didn't know about that? Okay. Ah, this is the white bass. You catch these at uh, a lot of them at Mays Point. That's uh, Maroon Americanus, we got that? Ah, here's another thing. Here's a granddaughter, where'd they go? There they are. They caught, they caught one, um, a fish with a net at the bottom of the lake, you know. And they said, Grandpa, we got this fish. Well, I thought it was an eastern slimy sculpin. And it was a different one. Do we have that neck? Don't throw it yet. We don't have it next? Okay. But it was a, it, they look a lot like a goby <coughs> to me. But they have these big fans for fins that they fan their eggs with. They do not have a spot on their dorsal fin, which, which is a big uh, distinction from it and a goby. They live in the shallows. Watch is why import, it's important to keep the lake levels, you know, well regulated, not too low because it'll kill the egg or they can't lay the eggs to start with. They lay their eggs under the rocks and they're the, one of the few indigenous fish for bait for lake trout. 
the original food for the lake trout. Okay. Northern sculpin, that's another sculpin that we have. Oh, the American burbot, which we think is in the lake. Reed and Wright thought it was in the lake, but I've never caught one. They're a real deep water fish. It's in a cod family. Cotted day, I think, is the name of the family. Look, it's got these little barbels there. Okay. Ha, ah, here's this fish. Every, Mr. Russo, I caught a white fish. You know why? Because they're white, <laughs> really white. But it's not a white fish. That's a freshwater drum. A white fish would have the adipose fin in here. And that's the fresh. These are new since 1909. They also have a molar teeth in their throat. And they like to eat shellfish and grind up the shell with their molar teeth in their throat. It all passes down through the digestive system. And then the shells are excreted. OK. Huh, this is the, you see the little black, little dark spot here? We call it Ocellus. That is, see how I think it looks similar to uh, the slimy sculpin. Well, they got these big bulgy eyes. They got these big fans for, for pectoral fins. And they're used for fanning their eggs to keep the, keep the oxygen going to them. Pretty well adapted fish. Ah, the dispersal of fishes. This is the, probably the most common dis method of dispersal that doesn't involve man. High water and flooding. Stream capture is another method. Natural random migration. Hitchhiking like the sea lamprey. The sea lamprey can hitchhike from one place to another on a fish, release itself as long as there's two of them. Human assisted, you have intention, intentional re introductions like the, the uh, rainbow and the brown from Europe. And the emptying of bait pails is another method of fish dispersal. That's why you got to have a registered ticket now when you buy bait. Live wells in your boat when you empty those. Aquariums, a snakehead or something, throw that out of their aquarium into the lady. Ship ballast, we got it. Okay, well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for joining me to uh, learn about fish in Cayuga Lake. Uh, thanks to Cayuga Lake Watershed Network and Trout Unlimited and Ithaca High School. So, see you again soon.